Good morning, everyone. We have a few public service announcements for you this morning, and I'll also preview one of the restart steps we plan to announce on Friday. First, I've asked our state librarian, uh, Jason Broden, who is helping lead the state's complete count efforts for the U.S. Census, to give an update on the response we're seeing. But to put it bluntly, our response rate remains very low. So we're asking Vermonters to take about five minutes today to complete their census form. Having a complete and accurate count of our population is critical in so many ways. It makes sure we have fair representation at all levels of government and determines the level of federal funds we receive. Receiving the right amount of federal support is always important. So we're getting back at least what Vermonters are putting in. But as we face a global pandemic and the economic crisis that's followed, making sure we get every dollar of federal relief we can is so important to our recovery. And it's not just for disaster relief. It's infrastructure projects, school lunch programs, and so much more. Even in the best of times, an accurate count is essential for our state and local budgets. Unfortunately, as of this month, only about half of all Vermonters have responded, which is one of the lowest response rates in the country, 47th to be exact. We need to do better because the fact is if we don't fully account for our population, another state will get that money for their roads, schools, hospitals, and more. I know it seems as though we've already asked a lot of Vermonters, but it only takes five minutes, and you could do it today. Fill out the form online at 2020census.gov or by phone at 844-330-2020. Uh, it's really pretty simple, and Jason will share more in a few minutes. I also want to mention, as we get into the heart of summer, Secretary Curley will give details on our upcoming state park opening, as well as guidance for events like parades and other celebrations with 4th of July coming up next weekend. Public Safety Commissioner Sherling and Dr. Levine will also provide some tips to help us stay safe as we look to have some fun over this uh, holiday weekend. Finally, I wanted to forecast some of what we'll be announcing on Friday as our regional data continues to show we can turn the spigot a bit more to welcome a few more visitors to our state. Last week, we announced the increase in capacity at restaurants and events to 50% beginning this Friday. And while our lodging facilities are already able to operate at this level, we know our travel restrictions make it difficult to reach even this capacity. Commissioner Pichek, working closely with our EPI team, has developed a creative and effective approach to allow much of the Northeast to visit Vermont without a quarantine, because they are coming from counties and other states with low case counts. On Friday, we expect to expand the number of states that are within driving distance of Vermont and can meet these trusted travel thresholds. As Dr. Levine and I discussed on Monday, we continue to need your help uh, to, to use your help uh, to slow the spread of this virus so we can protect our most vulnerable and our health care system. So we ask everyone to follow the guidance. Wash your hands. Stay six feet apart. Stay home when you're sick. And wear a mask whenever you can. These are all things that remain important even as we let up on some restrictions. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Jason, who's been doing an outstanding job as state librarian during this pandemic. And for an update on the census, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone. The information I'm providing will be a snapshot of census activity across Vermont. Uh, before that, I'd like to uh, thank Governor Scott for making uh, the census participation by Vermonters a continual reminder to be counted um, accurately once, only once. Along with that, I also want to thank the uh, Vermont Complete Count Committee members and all of our partners for their hard work during this um, unique time that we are all experiencing um, as a planet. And of course, the numerous local Complete Count Committees and the U.S. Census Bureau itself. The 2010 response rate for Vermont was 60.3% when it comes to self-reporting. 
at current for 2020, Vermont is at 54.7. Before March 3rd of this year, we were at 34%. I would like to really make people aware that that is such a tremendous amount that we have had to overcome because a lot of that had to be done by word of mouth, phone, and online types of activities. All in-person activities had to be stopped because we were all navigating COVID-19. At current, according to US Bureau, Vermont has just under 260,000 uh, occupied households and just over 190,000 have actually responded. That still leaves a very large delta of about 70,000 Vermont households that have not completed the census. Our highest responding county is Chittenden at 70.8% of the households responding, and our lowest is Essex with about 34% responding. The U.S. Census Bureau, um, as an update, is seeking relief from the federal government to extend the census uh, into October and then allow the reporting requirements to be conducted in 2021. We are uh, still following and navigating that information, but it would definitely allow all states across the country to continue census operations. We do have restart of the field operations across uh, Vermont going slowly with the U.S. Census Bureau, and we look forward to having um, a variety of different parts begin to connect with people to ask them to participate. Within that, though, the census res results affects our communities every day. On average, about $4,000 per person impacts uh, Vermonters when it comes to money that comes back to Vermont. And with that, an overall aspect is about $2.5 billion comes back to Vermont for a variety of items, such as for planning of roads, community items, hospitals, first responders, education, different types of grants, and a whole host of different types of items. This is only given once every 10 years. We ask that everybody please be counted in Vermont. And with that, we again want to make sure that people can take just a small moment, because you can do it online in just five minutes. And as the governor has said, 2020census.gov or by calling 844-330-2020. It's simple and fast. And yes, the census does not ask for social security numbers, bank accounts, or any other personal data. With that, I guess I ask you to please participate and be counted. Thank you. With that, I would now like to introduce Secretary Curley. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. As we all head into the summer months and the 4th of July holiday, we wanted to take a few moments to reinforce some of the guidance we have issued around celebrations and festivities in the weeks ahead. The Agency of Commerce has received several creative requests from towns and villages looking to reimagine their 4th of July festivities, keeping current restrictions on social gatherings fairs and festivals in mind. We have been impressed with the way these towns are putting public health first, while balancing the need to give Vermonters a way to responsibly celebrate their summer traditions. Many towns have worked with vendors, local businesses, and landowners to give residents a drive-in fireworks option. They've identified large open areas that allow for proper distancing, or relocated displays so that more citizens can see fireworks from their homes. They've put social distancing requirements in place and made a responsible plan that I hope other towns will consider. We have posted some of these plans on our website so towns can see what others are doing for summer events. We also recognize that many towns have cookouts, concerts, and parades on the 4th of July. While these events are not able to go off as originally planned, we know some have adapted. As an example, a fire station cookout changed from in-person dining to takeout, and parades can be altered, altered from a destination event to a longer, more spread out parade that enables people to view it from their front yards or their cars. On June 26, the event guidance we announced last Friday will take effect allowing for events of up to 150 people for an outdoor venue and 75 people for an indoor venue, given proper capacity 
and spacing requirements are followed. While our cherished summer moments will look different, the traditions and the spirit of summer in Vermont is alive and well. Another staple of recreating in Vermont is opening Friday, our state parks. The Agency of Natural Resources has been working to get the parks ready for visitors this Friday, and they will be fully operational. The parks have launched a modernized web-based reservation system with new features for making reservations easier. While traditional park services and amenities have been scaled back a bit, the parks will still offer day use activities, tent and RV sites, and lean-to camping. Successful state park programs like the Check Out the Parks Library Pass program and the Venture Vermont Outdoor Challenge can help people explore their home state in new ways. Travel restrictions and quarantine guidelines may reduce the number of out-of-state visiting, vis out staters visiting the parks, but that, that only provides greater opportunity for Vermonters to enjoy the beautiful outdoor landscape right in our backyard. Vermonters have made a lot of sacrifices over the last three months and worked creatively together to find new ways to do business, to recreate, and to support each other in these trying times. We hope this summer we'll, con we'll see continued support of our local communities and businesses as we all look to find new Vermont adventures waiting to be discovered. With that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Sherling for more on summer safety. Commissioner, Commissioner Sherling. Thank you, Secretary Croak. Uh, as, the, as the Secretary highlighted, uh, there's a lot to do outside in Vermont in the summer. Uh, as we keep talking about it, these three things, outside activities are preferred over inside with the COVID conditions uh, still in existence here in Vermont. So with that, uh, we encourage folks to be outside. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday there were, was a confluence of events uh, in South Burlington and Alburg, uh, where we appear to have lost uh, some uh, voters or or swimmers, um, so it's an opportunity to, uh, unfortunate opportunity to reiterate uh, safety guidance around swimming and boating as we encourage folks to get outside. Uh, so five points to keep in mind. Um, knowledge is first, know your ability. Uh, know the water temperature, know the weather. Uh, weather changes, uh, especially in the summer, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the hot conditions that draw people to uh, being outside and, and being in our lakes and rivers, uh, streams, um, also creates uh, pop-up thunderstorms that can dramatically change the weather in uh, just a short amount of time. So be mindful of that. Be mindful that uh, water temperatures still are a little chilly uh, in some places. Um, and know your ability. Uh, don't swim alone. Ensure that you use uh, a buddy system, um, that someone always knows where you are. Be mindful that on the water, distance is deceiving. Um, Things that look like they're in close proximity often are not uh, because of that deception that occurs uh, when looking at water and distance. File a float plan so that others know where you are, especially with small craft. If you're out in a canoe or a kayak or on a paddleboard uh, or a small windsurfer or a sailing vessel, ensure that people know where you're going and what time you an you're anticipated to return so that if uh, those timelines are missed, that folks can be sent out uh, to check for you. Um, ensure that you've got personal flotation devices. They're required for uh, anybody on a vessel uh, under the age of 12 years old, um, and they're required to be on board at least for every person that you're taking underway, in addition to having a throwable device. Uh, so be sure to have those uh, with you and at the ready. Um, and finally, uh, ensure that you're, um, you're following the rules of the road. Take a boater safety class. They're required for anyone born uh, after uh, January of 1974, um, and uh, be mindful that alcohol and swimming or boating often do not mix. Um, too much of, uh, of one can lead to tragedy uh, in the other. So uh, again, encourage folks to get out, uh, enjoy our lakes, rivers, and streams, um, enjoy boating, enjoy swimming, uh, but do so safely and keep those, uh, those key tips in mind. And more information is available. Uh, on the Department of Public Safety website. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Levine for an update. Good morning. Our holiday messaging to stay healthy is rather simple. 
Continue to follow the four rules of thumb to protect yourself, protect those who are vulnerable to serious illness, and to prevent spread of the virus. I think you've heard these once today. In education terms, we call this planned redundancy to reinforce the concept. Wear facial coverings around others if you can. Keep six feet apart. Wash your hands a lot. Stay home when sick. But while the messaging is rather simple, Vermonters have been hearing it like a broken record for months now. And maybe for some of you, it's becoming background noise. So I want to take a few minutes to remind us all why it is important. COVID-19 is new to the human race. We know a lot about it, but we're also learning. And day to day, we learn more. But we also learn more about what we don't know yet. It feels like forever, but our total Vermont active experience with this virus is just about four months. So what do we know? We know it's highly contagious, though a bit erratic and a little bit unpredictable at the same time. We know it spreads very easily from person to person, especially people who are within six feet of one another. It spreads more efficiently than the flu virus, with one person able to infect two to three others. It spreads through respiratory droplets, produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or even talks. And there's increasing evidence it can spread in aerosols, which can linger in the air that we breathe longer than the droplets. You get it when the droplets land on your mouth or nose, or possibly when inhaled. It may be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it, and then touching your face, which we all do way more than we realize. And it can be spread by people who are not showing any symptoms. So how bad is it really? Well, we all know that COVID-19 is especially dangerous for certain groups, like older Vermonters, people with chronic conditions, and for children and in adults who have uh, suppressed immunity. As of today, 56 of our fellow Vermonters and more than 125,000 Americans have died in just the past four to five months. And there are nearly two and a half million people who have had the virus, and those are only the ones we actually know of. Like some other infectious illnesses, many people are likely to experience only mild illness. But many others, some apparently healthy people, have become seriously ill and even died. Back in the beginning, I once said that this pandemic will soon turn out to be like the opioid epidemic. Everyone will know a friend or a family member who was ill with it, or how it affected people in their own community, and God forbid, perhaps someone who died from it. And at the outset, I emphasized repeatedly that 80% of those who get it will have mild illness. And that is still true. I do want to emphasize that when you look around the country now, the biggest age demographic of those who are getting tested and positive are those ages 18 to 44. Ages where we all think we're a little bit more invincible, perhaps, and aren't going to suffer very much. But what I would like to modify about what I've said in the past is that mild illness means no hospitalization, no complications, certainly no death. But it doesn't necessarily mean an easy time. I've been most impressed by hearing stories from people who both I know or people who have written to me discussing how the virus really knocked them down and how much worse it was than the flu or anything else they had experienced. Now, I'm not saying this to strike fear in the heart of everybody who's listening. I do want to say it, though, because while I always want you to protect the most vulnerable, it's not a bad idea to also protect yourself. I really sincerely believe you owe it to yourself to try and protect yourself until we have a vaccine. If we can learn a lesson from Sweden, 
where they've tried to let the population achieve herd immunity by just letting themselves get infected, it's that that is not a winning strategy. So why is this an important reminder? As the state reopens and more of us are outside being active, seeing family and friends, gathering in groups at, at events like barbecues, on the lake, or even at a protest, the risk of transmission does increase. But as I said before, please do some of these things. Your soul needs it. But choose wisely, understanding what activity for you in your particular circumstances is low risk and what may mean assuming too much risk. Even though Vermont is fortunate to currently have a low level of virus circulating in the state, that's not the same as zero. And this achievement can be fragile. But I'm very hopeful and cautiously optimistic. But the way to stay safe is not through top-down edicts. It must be a people-powered effort. And that means taking personal responsibility. If you're doing your part, thank you, and I do sincerely appreciate it. If you can do better, understand that I recognize, having been a primary care physician for so many years, that behavior change is hard, and it can take a while. But as you remember from when, it, when I started, it comes down to just the four simple things for all of us to have on our to-do list every day. Wearing the facial coverings, keeping six feet apart, washing hands frequently, and staying home when sick. I'd like to uh, look at some slides now just to show you our current experience in Vermont. As of last evening, 1,184 cases. Uh, still no change, thank goodness, in the 56 deaths. The slope of our curve, obviously continuing to be along the lines we'd like to see it, in spite of some recent outbreaks. Now, as we anticipated, there have been a couple of new clusters around the state in addition to the outbreak that started in Winooski. The count in Winooski stands now at 114 as of late yesterday evening, a total of four new cases since June 21st. No major changes in any of the other characteristics of this outbreak from what I have reported previously, so I won't repeat them. But looking at the, uh, what we call the epi curve, you can see that obviously the peak was in early June, and even with additional cases occurring sporadically through this later part of June, we are clearly uh, on a downward and stable slope. Um, and as I've mentioned before, for a, an infection that has an incubation period of 14 days, um, it takes time to see it totally peter out. Uh, but we're clearly on the right course. These are the total experience, not just Winooski, but our state experience. Um, you can see how that looks. And then finally, we'll just look at the final slide of the syndromic surveillance. Um, test positivity rates, in spite of some outbreaks, are still very, very low, way under 2%. On Monday, I reported an outbreak in Rutland County. This outbreak is associated with an employer in the Fairhaven region. The case count is now up to 12, and the testing of the workforce is ongoing. There will also be opportunities for testing in the community later this week, which will be announced. This investigation is early and, outgo and ongoing, and I do not have further details to share at this time. I also reported a Wyndham County family cluster and I'm happy to report that at this point, no new cases have been identified beyond the family. Testing has been ongoing and is being offered again today in Brattleboro. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. Calvin? Uh, thank you. Um, so, Governor, this might be a question for you or maybe Secretary Hurley, um, but so this week we've seen companies that weren't necessarily affected by um, the executive order, I'm thinking National Life, uh, Darn Tough Socks, um, they've had to lay off some people this, this week. 
I'm wondering if this could be an indication of maybe a second wave, if you will, of businesses kind of affected, uh, or if there's sort of an uh, economic impact there. Yeah, I'll ask uh, Secretary Curley to comment as well, but from my standpoint, I wouldn't say it's a second wave. This is, this is the wave. Um, I've been forewarning uh, that this is going to have economic ramifications. That's going to affect all of us uh, in some way. And no one is going to be left untouched. Some are going to be uh, more harmed than others. Uh, but again, all of us are going to feel this. And I think this is an indication, whether it's uh, National Life or Darn Tough Socks or the many, many restaurants and hospitality sector uh, lodgings and so forth, who are going to feel the brunt of this. Um, that's why this economic package uh, that we first uh, initiated uh, and provided to the legislature is so, so needed. And uh, we need to get this out the door as fast as we can to protect these other businesses um, and uh, so that they can survive uh, when we, we get to and turn the corner and bring more people into the state uh, that they can thrive as a result. But, but we're going to feel this uh, for quite some time. And it's up to us, it's not lost upon us, uh, to find ways to, to uh, provide for new opportunities for businesses and invite uh, more uh, of these businesses into Vermont as a result, as we've tried to do over the last three or four years. It's just going to be more apparent that uh, we have to put it on the front burner as soon as we possibly can. Secretary Curley. You nailed it. Cool. I have nothing to add okay. on that. And then I guess my only other question is, if we're seeing these companies that you know, weren't directly affected, you know, by the, the um, capacity or the, like, the restaurants or hospitality. Um, do you think that we could see maybe more companies like, you know, darn tough manufacturing or, or office jobs fold? I, or not fold, but uh, layoffs? Sure. Um, it, it, yes, I do. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you, you know, we're not just reliant on what's happening in Vermont. Uh, we. We are faced with what's happened regionally, uh, as well as uh, throughout the country, as far, and throughout the world, uh, as a matter of fact, because um, we have to sell these goods that uh, are being manufactured in Vermont. Uh, we're, again, not on an island, uh, and, uh, and it will have a ripple effect across all sectors, uh, I believe. So again, uh, it, just, it just makes our case uh, that, uh, that we need to provide relief just as quick as we possibly can. Uh, and it's not going to be enough. Uh, to be perfectly honest and blunt, uh, this is going to, uh, to uh, hinder us in, uh, in many ways over the next uh, year or two. But, uh, but again, if we can all pull together, uh, think creatively uh, and about how we can do things uh, as efficiently as possible, and then welcome more businesses, more people into the state, uh, I think we'll be a lot better off. Just continue to the same message that we started three or four years ago and highlight that. Right. Huh? Well, Governor, in relation to your um, announcement yesterday about unemployment insurance, is there a way to kind of quantify um, the, the impact it's going to have on businesses that are paying into that um, tax uh, in the immediate future? Yeah, uh, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Harrington to, uh, to comment as well. But uh, from my standpoint, uh, we had to, we based this on 2019 data. Uh, when things were pretty good, um, but we need to provide relief in any way we can to some of the businesses, uh, and uh, and this is a way of doing that, uh, as well as a little bit of relief for those who are going uh, to have to apply uh, for unemployment or continue to, to be on unemployment. Um, so uh, we thought this was a, a good move. It's not the, the total answer in any respect, um, but again, just to try and continue to be sensitive to the needs of business and the lifeblood of the revenue coming into the state and, and that we disperse from there. We need it uh, for, to keep government going. Uh, so uh, the, the stronger they are, the uh, stronger the businesses are, the stronger we are as a, as a state. Uh, Commissioner Harrington. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I would agree that the, the timing um, is certainly appropriate and, and certainly helpful for those businesses that are struggling. This is an annual determination, so it follows the uh, annual recalculation. Uh, and um, in this case, the number that was calculated does not take into, a, 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 um, into consideration what has happened as a part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and so uh, 
it does look at the calendar year of 2019 and makes the calculation and annual determination of um, the rate. Uh, and then the only other piece that I'll put out there, you know, the, the positive piece here is that this will provide relief for employers uh, over the next year. Um, the caveat or the concern there will be what does that calculation look like in subsequent years um, when it does include uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic numbers uh, for unemployment. So we're also monitoring those as well. Um, but the, the positive piece at this point is that it will provide relief for employers um, over this next, uh, next uh, year. So, so at what point would you reassess that if your if your concern is that any kind of a um, the, the hit to businesses is going to last months, maybe even into in next year and further? When you reassess whether the the trust is going to be yeah. able to we'll we'll continue to take uh, and assess that, uh, but it'd be uh, a year from now. Uh, that would be the plan to keep us on the same the same. Uh, um, timeline that we have in previous years. Uh, I would just want to remind everyone uh, we were in pretty good shape. We, w we were at a point um, not too many years ago uh, where the uh, unemployment trust fund was depleted, had to take a, a loan from the federal government, had to repay that loan. So there was nothing in the fund. Uh, rebuilt that to over uh, half a billion dollars in the fund uh, before the pandemic struck. Uh, at this point in time, we have a little over, um, and Commissioner Harrington could probably give us the exact number, uh, but I think it's around $325 million in the fund right now, even after, you know, 90,000 people applied, and, and now there's still uh, over, well over 40,000 on unemployment. Uh, but the good news is our fund is still intact. Uh, we may get through this without depleting it, which would be great news for us. Without other states like California, uh, it was three or four weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, they already took a loan out from the federal government because their unemployment fund was depleted. We're in good shape uh, in that, you know, the fiscal prudence uh, over uh, not just this administration, previous administrations uh, put us on the path to doing that in legislative action, uh, trying to make sure that we have all our our funds in place and are strong uh, and to to uh, account for things of this nature and when they come up so we could be proud of that mr harrington do you have the exact number at this point i do and this is as of uh, the 20th of june it was 342 million 398,835. And so again, and, and we provide this in our daily uh, report to the legislature, but um, you can see uh, that we are in a much healthier position than many other states. Um, and, and that is due to a number of different factors like the governor said, so. All right, we'll go to the phones and start with Greg at the Bennington Banner. Star six to unmute, Greg. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my first question, um, perhaps for the governor, perhaps for Commissioner Harrington. I have two questions, but that's okay. Sure. Um, on, on different topics. I'll try to be brief with both. Um, for the governor, perhaps for Commissioner Harrington, the additional $600 weekly benefit allocated through the CARES Act is due to expire on July 31st. Uh, there are undoubtedly people who will still need that additional funding after that runs out. My question is, What's the current guidance from Washington on whether an extension is the offering? And given the condition of the um, unemployment trust, uh, unemployment fund that you just outlined, is it possible the state could be creative to fill the gap? Um, a couple of things, Greg. Uh, first of all, I, I'm I'm not sure uh, that there's going to be any correction uh, from the from the Congress in between this time. Uh, it doesn't sound like it to me. Maybe a better question for the congressional delegation, uh, but we're preparing uh, that this will will go away. The six hundred dollars. That's why, you know, we're working so hard uh, to try and open up the economy in a safe manner, uh, to bring as many people off unemployment as possible, uh, and try to uh, grow the economy back to where it was uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, so it's essential uh, that we do that, uh, and again, provide relief uh, to those businesses so that they're there. Uh, when this uh, this other money runs out uh, to put people back to work. Uh, so it all has to work together. 
uh, but uh, but I'm not sure that we could, should rely on uh, on the Feds, uh, at least in the short term, um, because they're going on break uh, fairly soon, and I'm not sure that there's consensus on extending uh, that amount of money. Anything else, uh, Commissioner Harrington, on that issue that I missed? Uh, no, Governor. Yeah, no, you're correct. We have not heard anything in terms of an extension. It certainly is a point of conversation, but um, to this day, there hasn't been any indication as to an extension. The, to the question about um, you know being creative with the fund, there are very strict guidelines over how um, money in the fund is utilized. It has to be used for benefits. Um, it also um, is based on what the maximum weekly benefit amount or the determined benefit amount um, is, which is a annual, another annual determination and calculation. Um, and that uh, annual benefit amount will go up from $513 as a maximum to $531 as a maximum uh, on uh, July 1st. Um, but otherwise, we don't we don't necessarily have the ability to be creative or um, you know arbitrary in terms of how uh, the the fund is utilized and what types of benefits we would offer out of the fund. Yeah, I think we all realize the six hundred dollars was a tremendous uh, benefit to the number of people uh, on unemployment in the PUA uh, throughout this time. But um, but I don't think we can count on that in the future. Uh, you have another question? Okay. I do, I do. Um, this one is more of a health statistics question, so this might be more for Dr. Levine. Um, the, uh, presently, uh, presently, Vermont has a, re an, a retransmission rate of about one, according to what I have um, uh, seen on the internet in the, um, in the past day. The, um, the neighboring states, however, have lower retransmission rates, and several of those, um, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Maine, um, make mass use mandatory for customers as well as employees um, and people in public spaces. So as the state continues to turn the spigot, uh, aware that that activity raises the overall risk of transmission, is there any more thoughts of making masks mandatory rather than uh, rather than recommended for, for customers and people in public places. Yeah, um, you, you know, Greg, uh, I had talked about this uh, over the last few weeks, and it's a, it's a point of controversy for many. Now it's become more national than anything else. I continue uh, to worry about enforcement of the action, who, uh, who has to do this enforcement, whether it's the shopkeepers and so forth. Uh, we came up with a, uh, a plan where we allowed municipalities uh, to determine whether they want to become more strict than we are, uh, and a number of communities have done so. I uh, did have a uh, poll that was conducted by the, the grocers and retailers that we they provided to us uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, I did look at it uh, uh, quickly. I haven't uh, studied it, uh, but it's, it's very close. Uh, in fact, close enough uh, so that they decided not to uh, to give us uh, any indication or have a recommendation for us. I still would hope uh, that we could do this by guidance and education, uh, people do the right thing. You know, at the end of the day, I believe wearing a mask to protect others uh, is, uh, is a strength. Uh, it's not a weakness, it's a strength because you're helping other people. And if you can wear a mask, I, I would, um, would ask that you do do so, I do. Uh, if I go out, if I'm in public, I wear a mask because I want to protect uh, my fellow Vermonters. So uh, we'll continue uh, down that path. I uh, haven't made a decision on the mandatory portion, uh, but before we turn the, the spigot uh, uh, a bit more uh, for some of the retail locations, we'll do so. I do want to remind uh, folks that we have taken action uh, mandatory on any public transit, uh, which I think is a, a good idea as well. So that's been mandatory, allowing for municipalities to uh, take action, local control, take that into their own hands and require it has been fine. Uh, and having uh, retail operations do it on their own is fine as well. Uh, and I think what we need to do, and, uh, and I plan to talk about this with our, with our team a bit more in the next few days, is to come out with a, a better uh, plan uh, to inspire others to do the right thing and uh, in more of an education type of approach. But uh, regardless of what we do, uh, we'll, uh, we'll work, uh, work on that. Um, Mr. Levine, anything you want to add to that? 
I, I don't want to add anything to what the governor just said about the facial coverings. I wanted to just comment on your original part of your question, which referred to uh, the transmission rate, you called it, which is really yeah. an R with a subscript R T. R yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that comes off of a specific website, and we're actually, uh, we like the methodology on that website, and we've referred to it previously. We haven't referred to it recently, and the reason for that has to do with the fact that there's a special footnote that they include, and they actually call out two states, Alaska and Vermont. And they call out these states saying essentially that the number is less reliable when the number of cases is small. And admittedly, when we've got states around the country that are reporting four to 5,000 cases a day, and we're reporting uh, usually in the single numbers, if not a slight bit more, uh, it makes the number that they calculate unreliable. And they talk about a confidence band or a confidence interval. The confidence interval, even though one is the number that you mentioned, which is what they list us at, is 0 0.6 to 1.5. So I think you can see that that's such a broad band that the reliability of the number one would be suspect. And, and they will freely uh, <coughs> acknowledge that. So I'm, I'm not trying to distort anything about our data or anything, just trying to explain to the public at large that you can't really use their calculation with our current low number of cases in Vermont and have a reliable result. Uh, thank you. I'm sure that people might look at that website and not see that, so I, I appreciate the explanation. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. We'll now go to Mike at the Islander. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Uh, during a protest this month in Vermont, uh, three members of the Vermont State Police, while in full uniform, each took a knee as about 200 people stood around them chanting. Protesters who remained standing were carrying signs that said, among other things, no cops, defund the police, demilitarize police, and abolish police. The reader is wondering, Governor, if those are the positions of your administration and what was your personal reaction when you saw the video circulating of a state police commander and two troopers kneeling at the protest? I didn't see that particular uh, video, Mike, but, uh, but I can say uh, through all the actions I've seen from our, our um, law enforcement uh, throughout the state, and that's both municipal and state police uh, taking action like that. Uh, I think uh, is a sign of uh, leadership. Uh, I believe that uh, the uh, sensitivity uh, to what uh, the message is and was, and uh, and I and I think rising above uh, some of uh, some of what uh, they must have been feeling at the time. Um, I think uh, again is a sign of strength uh, for us, and uh, I think we're better off for it. As a result, I think it did uh, temper some of the frustration that we've seen across the state. Um, and there wasn't uh, the violence that we've seen in other uh, states as a result. So I think uh, the, the approach uh, that law enforcement took on this um, was, uh, again, uh, well-meaning, uh, meaningful uh, to many, and did uh, temper uh, some of the, the frustration and violence that uh, we've seen in other parts of the, the country. But do you favor no cops, defunding police, demilitarizing police? or abolishing police? No. And as a follow-up to Commissioner, to Commissioner Sterling, the state police used to have a policy about prohibiting political activity and remaining neutral. And I think Burlington Police, when you were a member, uh, also chief, didn't want officers being active in protests, like at Burlington had a bunch of abortion clinics, congressional offices, defense contractors, recruiting stations. I'm just wondering if and when did the state police change its policy? Thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, I wouldn't see this as, uh, as a you know active uh, political statement. Really, more uh, solidarity with uh, with folks around the nation and in Vermont, um, and a sign of that solidarity that uh, we all want things to be. Uh, 
to be improving and we want uh, law enforcement officers to be a trusted uh, part of the community. But they are taking a knee and when people call up to maybe file a complaint, are they gonna have their, their complaint uh, fielded as neutrally as uh, somebody who might be on the other side? I'm not sure I'm entirely following the question, but uh, again, um, you know, a show of, of solidarity with folks that are looking for uh, looking for the modernization of contemporary law enforcement uh, in Vermont. Um, I think it's it's less political and more uh, a human statement. Well, I mean, the, the signs were saying things about uh, defund the police and things like that. Uh, I mean, is that your position? And what do you think of the 30% fat and broken police that you just proposed? Well, not to, to stay on this topic for too long, but uh, you know, as I've said in prior press events and I've testified on the legislature over the last couple of weeks, um, the, the phrase that the governor uses most often is that there's far more that unites us than divides us. And I think on this topic, the same is true. Uh, when you hear people talk about defunding, in some cases it takes the, the form of the discussions that are happening in Burlington, but most often it really is about investing in the areas uh, that are going to have the most impact, uh, positive impact on our communities. And you know, we put forth a slate of modernization initiatives, including a modernized criminal justice and public health system back in January. Um, that very closely parallels the kinds of things um, that are being talked about around the country. Um, and not to skirt the Burlington issue um, and answer that directly, uh, I do think that is a, uh, a misplaced effort. I do believe that there are uh, investments that can continue to be made in the city, that they've got a, a decades-long history of being innovative uh, in everything from body cameras to policy to, uh, to mental health outreach um, and social service provision together with uh, police officers. I was talking earlier today as uh, we were doing a COVID briefing around some of the strategies that we were using uh, in our 10 or 12 years ago when the opiate epidemic really started to unfold where we were bringing public health nurses, um, social workers and others out door to door uh, to try to have a positive impact on uh, the, the, the trend and the curve we were seeing uh, in opiates. And I think the opportunity for Vermont is to do the same thing on multiple topics. So while I, I would not favor a cut in the, in the budget in Burlington because I believe um, there is an underinvestment there like in many areas of government, um, I do very much support um, the idea of investing other dollars in more targeted approaches earlier on, uh, prevention, education, outreach, and intervention, and again, some of the things that we were talking about earlier this year in modernization. We still have about just to be clear, just, just to be clear, uh, so you don't see any potential disciplinary action against the uh, state police commander and the two troopers that took a knee? No, not at all. All right, Mike, we gotta, yeah, we got to move. We still have 18 folks in the queue, and it's about noon, so just as a heads up to everybody. Uh, Lisa from the AP. Lisa, AP. Hi, thanks. Um, this is a question for the governor and uh, Commissioner Sherlin, a related question. So the Senate is taking up a couple of bills or probably going to get final approval to a couple of bills that are related to police reform. Um, one would ban chokeholds by police and require police to intervene if they see other officers using a prohibited restraint and then a second bill would require agencies to comply with race data reporting requirements. Do you support those and, and what do you think of them? Um, I'll comment first, then ask uh, Commissioner Sherling to give uh, further comments. Um, from my standpoint, uh, I think there's uh, a lot of good uh, in those two bills, uh, but obviously I just want to reiterate what I've said numerous times over the last uh, three or four years. It's just passing one body at this point. Uh, it still has to get through the Senate, uh, go to the House, uh, and then we'll see what, what the bills look like in the end. Uh, we think there is uh, some areas of improvement uh, that we could make. Uh, but the body cameras are something that we uh, promote, uh, we, we uh, agree with. 
Um, there's other uh, areas uh, where a lot of agreement, if you go back to my state of the state or the budget address, I can't remember which, I talked about um, there was a pilot program uh, where we had uh, embedded uh, a mental health uh, counselor uh, in the state police barracks in St. Albans. Uh, it was a great pilot program uh, that was successful, and we wanted to uh, promote that and enhance that and bring it to other uh, barracks throughout the state. And we had, uh, we had planned on doing that, and I know there's a lot of talk about that in the Senate as well. So there's a lot of areas of agreement uh, with us. Uh, we think we can always improve. Uh, and uh, so again, there's, there's far more that we agree with than don't, uh, and I think we can get through this. Commissioner Sherling. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I think the governor covered the bulk of it. Um, there is more in those bills that we agree with and disagree with. I think there's a couple of nuanced uh, areas where I've been talking uh, with legislators in, in public testimony over the last couple of days about potential enhancements or modifications. Um, it, it, of note, uh, you know, the, the state police and other agencies around the state already prohibit um, what, what are called actually neck restraints chokeholds um, is a more of a pejorative term um, unless certain circumstances are met. Um, it, it is important for the public to understand that uh, one of the things we're, uh, that we testify to is that um, there are, we're circ in circumstances where, uh, un the unfortunate circumstances where lethal force is required, um, or necessary uh, that a chokehold may be or a neck restraint may be a better course of action than using uh, a vehicle or a baton or a firearm. So there's that one tiny caveat um, that we've, we've testified to. It's you know, the unfortunate reality of some, some violent encounters. Again, those are very rare, um, but the bulk of the rest of, uh, of the bill uh, and, and the components are either already things that are in policy um, here at a state level or are things we are supportive of. Okay, but it's mainly the neck restraint issue that, that you have yeah, to Yeah, we are supportive of the ban um, with a, a tiny caveat that there are, it's not an instance that we've ever run into before, but it's not uh, something that um, the door should be completely closed on because there are occasional instances uh, around the country where an officer is in a fight for their lives or for someone else's life, and it's a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, and uh, a neck restraint may be the, the area of last resort. So I don't want to overemphasize this, but I think for transparency, uh, those listening should know that that's the area where um, we've testified there needs to be just a tiny sliver of opportunity um, for those things not to be completely, um, to not for that door not to be completely closed. I mean, the basic analogy is this. In a scenario where using a firearm is an appropriate use of force, uh, a neck restraint should also be an appropriate use of force. Again, incredibly rare circumstance. Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAX. The governor thought we saw this past weekend some visitation at long-term care facilities and there were kind of creative solutions for how to do that, what we're visiting through windows and things like that. How has the administration been discussing that solution for maybe patients who are bedridden or can't necessarily get up and go to a certain point to meet with their family? Um, obviously, we've been talking about this for quite some time, and uh, so we didn't forget those in our long-term care facilities. That's why we put the guidance forward. Uh, we certainly are looking for as much creativity as possible uh, so that we can get uh, those who are in those community settings uh, back with their families um, so that they can uh, get some of the uh, emotional relief that they need, both sides need, uh, as a matter of fact. So I may uh, ask Secretary Smith to comment further on this. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. Obviously, what we announced last week was phase one. There's going to be several phases of uh, uh, along this uh, line that uh, will allow um, sort of a gradual reopening of uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities. I will say this, it probably won't be like it used to be. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to be opening up as much as possible. We, we talked about, you know, the next phase includes uh, gradual loosening of uh, of uh, restrictions on group uh, dining, group activities, and non-essential 
workers entering the facilities. It includes an increase in visitation. Uh, those next f uh, phases will be linked to the level of the virus in the community as well as uh, those next phases will be linked to a more enhanced uh, testing protocol uh, to make sure that we can ease those, uh, those restrictions and still make sure we have a good handle on the virus as we're moving forward. Moving through these phases uh, will require um, the ability to keep appropriate staffing, uh, strict standards, and access to uh, PPE. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see as we move forward here, but I can tell you right now there are groups meeting on how we're going to enhance our uh, testing protocol at long-term facilities so that we can move through these phases in the most expeditious way. So uh, stay tuned. You'll hear more shortly. And just another quick question for Governor Scott. Uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut just announced a 14-day quarantine. Just curious if those governors reached out to you for any advice or um, perspective. They have not. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, it's been said frequently in these uh, briefings that um, things will change somewhat uh, when there is um, a vaccine for COVID. And that makes me wonder, are there plans um, in a in the works right now on how to acquire enough of the vaccine to uh, help people in the state and distribute it quickly and also um, is there um, a target percentage for people to um, be vaccinated in order to um, protect the bulk of people in Vermont aside from those who are vaccinated? Uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. I would say uh, our target is 100%, uh, and then we prioritize from there, obviously, uh, to try and protect the most vulnerable first. That was very well said. The um, preparation is already beginning even though we're not even close to having anything on the market uh, that's passed the requisite efficacy and safety trials to make sure that it would work against the virus in most people and be safe for them to take. The um, health department and others across the government have set up a working group that is looking at every aspect of vaccines, so not just uh, how to acquire them and making sure we acquire sufficient quantity, but all of the logistics that go around how to administer them and make sure that uh, we don't run into problems on the supply end with having the appropriate amount of syringes or needles or refrigeration uh, capacity, etc. cetera. Um, there's a whole host of things that go into what I would term vaccine science that uh, we're well aware of. Um, the health department runs an incredibly large vaccine program um, across the state, across all ages. So we need to apply that vaccine science and our knowledge about what it takes to effectively do this on a large, large scale, which as the governor said, ideally would be 100% uh, of those who would like to have the vaccine should be able to access it. Again, we talk often in terms of herd immunity and needing you know, 60 or 70 percent of a population to be exposed or to have had antibodies against the virus till we know that it won't be transmissible that great in the, in the population. But when it comes to a vaccine, you know, we really look to vaccine the entire uh, population that needs to have a vaccine to benefit from it. And so that would obviously not force anyone to have a vaccine who doesn't choose to do so. But at the same time, the last thing we'd want to do is have to ration a vaccine. 
because there wasn't enough available or because our state could not obtain enough. Fortunately, the federal government understands those principles as well and are um, trying to do similar planning uh, while there's time now before a vaccine would become available. Does that answer your question? can't give you the number. It probably would be higher than 70%. As you know, when we have kids going into school and continuing through grade school, we want to have 95 or more percent vaccinated against a condition like measles because of the severe consequences getting measles could have. Um, I'm quite confident that even though there are uh, a number of Vermonters included in the national, what we term vaccine hesitant community that have concerns about vaccines, um, it would not amount to such a huge percent that it would impede our ability to really help the majority of Vermonters and prevent the spread of this uh, very novel virus uh, amongst the population. Greg, the county courier. Hi, Governor. Um, I, I want to ask today about the uh, numbers being published by DFR and, as well as the health department. Uh, health department on your website is publishing uh, the total number since the pandemic began, as well as the total number breakdown by county. Um, the reports are uh, on DFR's website are broken down on a on a per population basis, and and those are for current cases. So, uh, number one, I I kind of like to know uh, what does it take for a positive case to turn into a recovered case, and then uh, number two, um, I'd like to know. Uh, why the state isn't being a little more transparent as far as current cases per county. Uh, in order to figure that out, at least here in Franklin County, you have to kind of divide by a million and then figure out what the population is. And, and uh, here in Franklin County, it's pretty easy to figure out that there are two current cases. Uh, but a lot of that is because we all knew that Franklin County was stuck at 99 cases for a long time. We got three more, one of them died, we're down to two. So at what point can we expect that that current case count is a little more transparent and easy to find? And how is the state coming up with uh, what a current case is? At what point does somebody become recovered? I might uh, ask Commissioner Levine uh, to comment, uh, and I would just remind everyone that uh, on Fridays uh, we'll have Commissioner Pichek on, uh, who will do some more modeling, and, and some of those questions might be able to be answered by him. But, Commissioner Levine. Yes, I'll do my best. The, um, the data that you see on Fridays is, is clearly active cases, and it has a specific purpose in mind. Um, well, many purposes, but the one specific purpose we highlight has to do with travel uh, and the need to quarantine or not quarantine coming in or going out of the state. 
um, and put a level playing field across a region so that we can compare apples to apples. Um, I don't think there's any effort to be not transparent about anything. I think the, the biggest effort we have in the health department is making sure we're providing information that is useful to people and that they want to see. Um, when it comes to how do you become recovered, bottom line is there's several ways that happens. Number one is through the extensive contact tracing process and the SARA alert process and the communicating that goes back and forth between people who have been identified as having the virus. Uh, so if there's knowledge because of that communication that the person is recovered, that is considered recovered. There's also a um, metric of how many days have elapsed since the time the patient first had a positive test. Um, and I'm not going to say this specific because I don't have it in the back of my mind right now. It's either two weeks or 30 days. But it basically uh, it allows you to be put into that recovered category as well. The reason there's always a delta in what you see on the first slide that I present between the total cases minus the deaths uh, not equaling the recovered is because many of those cases are new cases and they still fall within this window of time where they are active cases. So they can't have recovered yet by, by our definition. So I think the perception that I'm hearing from people is that the number of non-recovered per county and, and even per town would be a whole lot uh, more important and, and more informative than the number of people total that have gotten it in Franklin County since the pandemic began because, you know, the first 99 that had it have been, have recovered, they're no longer an issue for the general public. So mm -hmm. when, when can the state start publishing that current uh, infected, known infected number? We'll get back to you on that, okay? We'll talk to our data people. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Secretary Friend. Um I'm understanding that the, uh, the Vermont NEA is asking uh, the state to convene a statewide reopening commission for the schools. Um, they're saying that it's unrealistic for school districts to plan in isolation and for the Agency of Education to plan without input from people on the ground. And New, New Hampshire is doing something like this. Is Vermont going to follow suit with that? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure yet. I'm uh, going to attend a meeting with Vermont NEA later on this afternoon. Um, but I think to the point at the state level, we've been very uh, collaborative uh, involving a lot of stakeholders in the production of our health guidance. I think the question now is how to implement that guidance. And I'm not convinced uh, that that input uh, would not be best harnessed at the local level. And I think districts are going to have to do a lot of planning uh, to implement the guidance. So I'm not sure uh, to what extent implementation uh, should be guided at the state level. We're certainly there to support. Uh, but I think there's going to be a need for a lot of community engagement at the local level. Um, and perhaps that's the concern. But I'll find out more as I engage with them later on today. Um, is, is there any way that uh, you can let, let us know where that's going? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. John, VPR. Thanks. Uh, question for the governor. Uh, the legislature is working on a number of issues, including an active 50 bill. It's had a bumpy road, but it is uh, still actively being amended and sent a natural resources. Uh, what do you think of that bill, and, and in particular the forest uh, fragmentation piece that would require 250 review for roads longer than 2,000 feet? Yeah, we have concerns about uh, some aspects of the bill. Uh, we've been working uh, with the committee, with the with the chair. We, in fact, over the weekend we had a um, number of uh, conference calls on this and and trying to come up with solutions where we can work together as you. Remember, uh, in the beginning, uh, we had uh, provided an Act 250 bill to the to the House, I believe, in the Senate as well. But um, where we had some collaboration with some of the environmental groups, um, trying to find a way to work together uh, to get common agreement on what 
what uh, would work best for Vermonters. Um, we, again, uh, are hopeful uh, that uh, we'll be able to uh, implement some of the, the uh, parts of the bill uh, that we think are essential and work with them uh, on others. Uh, obviously, uh, it has to get through the, the Senate, um, and then we'll see what happens from there. But uh, we're an active uh, partner in trying to at least uh, have a voice uh, in this discussion, and, and thus far it's, uh, we're doing so. Uh, but we'll see what happens. I know they're, I believe they're going to be debating this, uh, this bill this afternoon. There was, it's a bumpy road as you, as you uh, described. I think they tried to attach it to a housing bill previous to this, and uh, which wasn't germane. And so um, and now they're going to take a different approach. But we'd like to see something, something pass that would be helpful uh, to, uh, to Vermont. the extension of Act 250 on this forest fragmentation piece if, if you have to go through a, a, a taking. Yeah, we have, have concerns about many parts of the bill, uh, and there are other parts that uh, we think uh, would be uh, tremendously helpful. Um, so we've been, again, trying to pursue some of the helpful parts figure out what uh, what we can uh, we can agree to unite on uh, and uh, try and get something passed do you, do you think it's a taking um, I think it's uh, very complicated uh, and there's uh, ramifications as a result of that okay. uh, and then a very quick question about revenues when do you get the next I should know this I know but uh, the next revenue projection and I think that goes sometime in August, but yep. do you have any, any? We'll, we'll get, we'll get some, um, you know, on a monthly basis. Are you talking about the quarterly? I'm talking about, yeah, the, the budget bill now says uh, they want the next, I think it's annual revenue projections to, oh, for July. Uh, you know, come, yeah, to come up with the next budget, the, the, yeah. the next full year budget for the three, three quarters budget. Again, I'm not sure that we'll have all the numbers uh, by the time uh, they come back uh, from their recess, but uh, uh, maybe Secretary Young uh, is on the uh, line and could comment on that. Uh, yes, I am, Governor, thank you. Normally, the emergency board would be meeting uh, on or around July 15th to meet with the state and legislative economists to finalize the revenue forecast for um, the FY21 and 22 budgets. The legislature is putting that off um, with our support uh, until August, uh, sometime probably mid-August, but we will have the, the best number of available for us as we wrap up our work on the full FY21 budget. So that, that's the uh, revenues for purposes of um, forecasting and uh, working on our budget. On a monthly basis, we look at our revenues, and there is a monthly press release that comes out. And if you don't get that, we'd be happy to put you on our uh, distribution list. Uh, no, thanks. I, I get that. I just wanted to know when the, when the big one was coming. But thank you very much. As, as you might recall, we uh, we did extend uh, the filing date, uh, and so that's what's made it uh, a little bit more problematic in terms of how much money revenue is coming in even uh, from uh, the tax uh, returns. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, we'll go to Kat at WCAX. Hi, I have a couple questions um, just to clarify a few details about these clusters that have come up. Um, what kind of business is this in Fairhaven? Is, is there any sense of how the virus got there? Dr. Levine. So, Kat, I really cannot convey the name of the work site as that would be identifying to the individuals who work there and who are actively isolating and quarantining. Nor can I say how the virus got there, not because there's anything to hide. Uh, so often it's really not possible to understand how a case became a case, um, even though you try to elicit as much of a story as you can and make some connections. It often just is challenging. 
when the virus is at a very low level across the population and, and can spring up at any point. So shouldn't the Fairhaven community know which business it is? Uh, I imagine some people are wondering if they've had contact with this business and what that might mean for them. Yeah, no, obviously if there was a um, public health consequence of um, not letting them know, we wouldn't want to face that. So I, I wouldn't want them to be concerned that um, they can't go about their normal lives at this point in time. Again, using all of the four rules of thumb that we've always pointed out. So there's no concern that this business may lead to other cases in the community? I mean, people go home, they go, you know, they go to work, they go home, they, they interact with other people. Yeah, no, at this point in time, uh, the investigation is ongoing, but we don't believe there's a concern. I mean, I, I'm curious just because we've had other locations identified when cases show up, um, you know, think long-term care facilities, correctional centers, things like that. Yes. Why would businesses be Right. No, you are correct. When there, there's a facility of that sort, we do usually uh, uh, convey that information. Uh, in this case, though, conveying the information can be very highly identifying and uh, injurious to the population and uh, not respectful of uh, requirements that we have to follow for not disclosing information. We're not identifying the people at the facility who, who would have it, just the well, but often, location. But, but, often, but oftentimes, if I might uh, disagree, you are, uh, based on um, people's knowledge of the facility uh, alone. So again, we have to be protective of personal health information and uh, have respect for the people that uh, did not choose to become ill with this virus. Right. So this is not a high type of business and that people would have been shopping at or visiting in? That's correct. Okay. Um, Fairhaven's on the New York border. Are the cases Vermonters or people from New York who work in Vermont? So we're trying to sort through that as we speak. We're working very closely with the New York State Department of Health as well. Okay. Um, you know, this, this is another example, as we've said in many uh, times over the course of the last several months, where the virus does not respect the border. Often there are people who actually live in another state but seek care at one of our own hospitals because it's closer than anything to where they live, even though they live in a different state. Um, and in this case, just like in many cases, there are people who work in one state and live just across the border in the other state. But all the cases that are for people who live in Vermont will be recorded as Vermont cases. And New York will likewise list the cases that are from New York residents as New York cases. <clears throat> Quick clarifying question on the Wyndham County family cluster. How many cases are in that one? Uh, that's one family. How many cases? I, I can't really release the number of cases. Why not? Again, when uh, we live in a small state with small towns, and when the number is below um, a certain level, our statisticians tell us that uh, that's no longer protective of personal information. So suffice it to say, it's not a, it's not a large number. Like, are, are, like below 10? I mean, we're just trying to get it like small, the amount of large and small can mean different things to different people. Yes, well below 10. Okay. So like four, okay, got it. So then how do you define a cluster? Like what's the threshold of cases before it becomes an outbreak? Yeah, so a cluster is generally, um, it, as in the case we just discussed about uh, perhaps within a family, within a household, um, not distributed across the population so much, um, and an outbreak is generally um, spread beyond one local household. There's a, there's a number of public health criteria that are, are pretty laborious to go through, to be honest, 
but um, they involve number and they involve uh, the degree of transmission uh, beyond one particular source, if you will, one particular household. It's 12.30 and we still have 11 callers in the queue. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, um, Dr. Levine, uh, Kat did a good job of trying to figure out uh, what type of business this is, but um, can you at least say if it's a manufacturing business or a retail business in, say, the Fairhaven area? Yeah, I, again, I can't really divulge any more information than I have. All right, so um, while I'm moving on, I wanted to ask about the, the, it looks like the fatal opioid, opioid overdoses have increased quite a bit this year over last year. And I'm wondering, um, what do you think is causing this? Um, and how is the state responding? I'm going to let uh, Dr. Levine uh, again weigh in on that. Um, but I do want to remind everyone uh, some of the statistics we uh, you know, I keep track of this as well. It's in my weekly reports uh, about the number of uh, ODs uh, regarding opioids. And we saw a dramatic drop uh, during the pandemic, uh, an incredible drop. Uh, and then when things started to open back up, uh, we're seeing those numbers increase. So it looks as though, in some respects, uh, that it's increasing at a and it is at a very very rapid pace, uh, getting back to where it was pre-pandemic. Um, but but I wouldn't say, uh, and Dr. Levine can probably give uh, the numbers. Um, but I wouldn't say that we're over what we were last year. Uh, it's just a matter of, of of that increasing rate since the pandemic uh, began. But it looks like in April there were 17 fatal overdoses. April 2020 and in April 2019 there were eight. So um, Correct. it does, does seem as though we might be over last year, and at least in some periods of time. So I'm, I'm glad you gave us a chance to talk about this problem in general, this issue. Um, and I'm sorry I delayed, but I had to get my numbers. Um, so there's two sets of numbers. There's fatal overdoses, and then there are just overdoses that present either to EMS or to a healthcare setting that are non-fatal. So if we look at the non-fatal overdoses, compared with March of last year, they were nearly double in March of this year. If we look at fatal overdoses, they also doubled, as you just pointed out, going up to 9 and 17 for March and April of this year, whereas last year they were 4 and 8. March and April. So that's for both months. That not, if there were 17 in March and April combined. No, no. 17 was April. Nine was March. Oh, I see. Okay. So keep in mind, things began with COVID in early to mid March, and then things began to accelerate later in March and in April. So. These are, this is early numbers in, and it's hard to make definite correlations and causality. But at the same time, we know, based on our own experience and national experience, that there probably is some relationship here with having a pandemic and all of the behaviors a pandemic uh, imposes upon us, if you will. So number one, whether you have an opioid use disorder or not, I, I can't find too many people who haven't said that this doesn't stress them out. And so stress is obviously a very potent factor. And if you're already using uh, pharmacology drugs to respond to stress in your day-to-day -day life, and then you impose one of the biggest stresses the population has ever had to live with, um, you could see that that might change uh, and exacerbate some behaviors. Can also lead to more, not just anxiety, but depression. And we know that those are often associated with uh, substance misuse as well. We know that people who uh, use uh, injection drugs 
often are living in a very isolated way. Uh, and that alone makes them at a higher risk of having an overdose and perhaps of dying from an overdose. Um, the pandemic has only exacerbated that because now they may not even have another individual with them while they're injecting. And that used to be, a, if you will, a safety net for the person because uh, there'd be someone there who could administer naloxone, help resuscitate them, um, guide them, be with them. So just having a support network is changed when you're in a stay home, stay safe kind of la climate and uh, the normal groups that you would be with are no longer as coalesced as they usually are. And then we get down to people who exploit things like pandemics. So certainly those who deal in drugs um, would find this to be perhaps a time that they could actually capitalize on it, maybe make more money, charge more. Um, maybe the supply routes aren't the same for an individual who has become dependent on a certain supply route and they have someone else that they're purchasing from, so they know less about that drug. They don't know that it's the same type of drug they've been always purchasing from the same person because it's a totally different supplier. So maybe there's a propensity to having a worse outcome just because they got some drug that they actually didn't know. It was mostly fentanyl as opposed to what they've been getting wow. before that was less. I, I do want you to understand, though, that you know the prime antidote, if you will, is naloxone. And naloxone has not dried up as part of the pandemic. It's obviously still available for everyone who needs it. And we took some special precautions because we know that in the homeless population, there's often been an issue with substance misuse as well. And we wanted to make sure that that population, who we were now making all efforts, full bore efforts to house, uh, had ready and continued access to naloxone. We also opened up the website that I've mentioned at a few press conferences during the pandemic, vthelplink.org. Another potential causal link, if you will, is recovery centers are no longer in person. Uh, like everything else in our society, they had to, uh, at that point in the, in the calendar year, um, not have a public uh, face, if you will. Didn't mean they stopped being helpful, stopped doing business, that people who had counselors and people who had support colleagues broke those ties, but at the same time, it was much more challenging because they were relying on telephones and technology and not on person-to-person -person help. So I think that probably uh, accounts for a little bit as well. Um, and the last thing I'll point out, though, is I don't want anyone to come away with the thought that lack of access to medication-assisted treatment was a cause uh, and led people to persist in their habit of utilizing drugs that are dangerous uh, instead of using MAT, because all efforts were made to still continue the supply of MAT, if you will, make it accessible for those who were on it. Uh, it no longer required in-person visits to get a prescription, uh, and there were a lot of very uh, effective ways of getting the drug, uh, like buprenorphine, to the person. Also, our hubs didn't shut down. Obviously, there are people who needed to go to hubs to get methadone and other treatments and support. Uh, those continued on in the way that they've been continuing till now. So. Um, a lot of things that we can hypothesize might be related that a pandemic would produce, but hopefully a lot of things that we've tried to at least put into play that would allow people to have some modicum of safety uh, during this process. We're going to be watching these numbers really closely because obviously we're no longer in as restrictive a climate now in terms of stay home, and uh, we would hope to see some moderation in those numbers, but clearly like so many things about the pandemic, this is another potential tragic outcome um, that um, just reflects the challenges that everyone, no matter what their own personal circumstances, is going through. So, um, thank you so much for all that info that was kind of said there. Um, I guess my only other question is not about um, 
the illicit drug use anymore. It's just the regular commercial COVID-19 testing. I'm wondering if that commercial testing, those results will be integrated into the state results so that we will be able to know, um, you know, the outcomes of people who are getting tested in doctor's office or wherever. Yeah, so um, the majority of those results should actually be included in the results that we see every day. Um, there's a reporting requirement for, for this illness, and um, I wouldn't think that too many results have escaped our attention. Okay, good to know. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. If there's time, I'd be interested to hear what your reaction is to the drivers down in Talladega. But for Suzanne Young, I, I was looking, you mentioned the revenue numbers, and one thing that caught my eye from the main numbers is that the personal income was not really down very much, only 4%. And is there is there some reason for that? Maybe the, the way it's accounted for? Obviously, the consumption taxes were way down. Um, is there some other sort of technical reason why the personal income actually wasn't that bad? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question right at my fingertips, but I, I do have um, a report from our economist that I can refer to and get back to you on that, Tim. But I, I think um, many people have been filing um, more than we thought uh, would be filing, and that may be part of it. Yeah, given the, given the uh, unemployment number is so high. Okay, great. I'll look forward to hearing, hearing more about Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, in regards to uh, NASCAR and the race the other day, um, I saw the aftermath and some of the pictures associated with that. And for those who didn't see, it was uh, all the NASCAR drivers, uh, teams uh, in unison uh, pushing the car of the only African-American um, driver in NASCAR uh, to the starting point. Uh, and it was just a incredible moment uh, when you saw you know, NASCAR really taking a leadership role in all of this uh, in trying to promote uh, the unison uh, that we need to, to see across our country. And uh, I think it was just a powerful moment uh, for all of us. The, the picture um, spoke a thousand words. Great, thank you. All right, Andrew, Caledonia Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, thank you for taking these questions. Um, I'll shift gears a bit to the census since you opened the conference on the topic. You mentioned that Essex County is having the lowest response rate in the state, and I see the rest of the Northeast Kingdom is not far behind. Uh, do you have any notion on why the region is trailing the state so significantly? And will the state be taking any additional steps aside from this type of awareness effort to bring the response rate up? Well, I can see uh, Jason has been waiting patiently to answer that very question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. The Northeast Kingdom is definitely what we would consider a very uh, unique geographic location. You do have a variety of people who have second homes, um, in some cases third homes. And within that, our goal with the census is to make sure that we are dealing with occupied households. In working with the U.S. Census Bureau, what we will also be doing is making sure that we review what those are with the local community to make sure that we are accurately reporting who is where. Once that has been determined, we will then also increase outreach efforts to the community to make sure that they participate. That, of course, again, is because geography is rather large. Um, right now, of course, we're asking people to do it online. And in some cases, that might not be the best uh, means for them to utilize it based on their geography with broadband limitations. So we are asking a variety of situations to uh, hopefully make a positive outcome. You had a question? Thank you for that. OK. Um, and uh, yeah, and can you uh, just reiterate a bit why really residents should care? It is one of the consequences that the kingdom might lose representation in the state legislature if it's undercounted? 
that definitely would be one of the um, considerations. The census participation is a constitutional item, and it allows everybody to have representation. If the numbers are not where they are at once the census completes its report and gives it to uh, Congress and also to the president, the next remaining step is to then bring those numbers back down to the, each of the states. The state will then have to examine what it looks like if there is a decrease in the amount of people who are participated. So it's also not only a representative type of item, it's also a financial and fiduciary specific consideration to examine. Right now we're going through a lot of, um, I would say, circumstances that require us to have money coming in from the federal government. The CARES Act would be one of the best, and from my standpoint as the uh, Commissioner of Libraries, I can give you a small tidbit on how that could be impacted. Vermont was able to receive uh, $56,834.12 um, for 196 public libraries, some K through 12, and also higher ed to figure out what we would want to do with that. And looking at that, one of the things that made me very, very, um, I would say, unhappy would be that they used the 2010 census records which meant that Vermont had a 60.3% participation rate. And so that allocation is based upon what they actually had. So all the things that we do now need to be considered high on our list of participating because we won't have another time to do this until 2030 to make any adjustments. So we need to pay as much attention to having people please participate and complete their census. Thank you. Guy Page. Hello, Governor. Uh, two weeks ago, you said that if the legislature passed S348, the vote by mail bill, you would uh, take a look at it then. It passed last week without any of the amendments proposed to protect against possible fraud or ballot harvest abuse. Has S348 reached your desk yet? And if so, do you think you might veto it? Um, a couple of things. One, I have not received the bill um, that, I, that I know of. Uh, we've been waiting for that uh, for the last week or so since it passed. Uh, I did say publicly um, that if it... Um, as long as it was as we thought it was, um, I wouldn't stand in the way uh, of it passing. And uh, I may have differences of opinion uh, as to why that is, but, um, but again, I made the, uh, the pledge uh, to let it go through uh, and uh, will not be vetoing it if it comes over as, as was planned. But we haven't seen the bill yet. Um, I, uh, well, I was wondering if there were any updates on the Chittenden Regional Testing, um, if it's all been conducted and if there were the results. Is this in the correctional facility? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Secretary Smith. The uh, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility um, in South Burlington is being tested today. Um, I think we'll have most of the results in by 1 o'clock. They'll run through the lab tonight. We'll have the results tomorrow. Um, why I'm here, I'll just um, say there, there is a new positive inmate case at Northwest State Correctional Facility. Uh, there are now new positives in one new positive in Northwest, one new positive in Chittenden, which we're testing today, and one uh, new positive uh, from uh, all three of these cases are new entries into our Vermont system at Marble Valley. As you remember, we tested Marble Valley on Saturday. It was negative other than the one uh, new entry case that came into Marble Valley. We'll be testing Marble, Marble Valley again on Monday. Uh, the, the new positive case was detected at Northwest Correctional Facility on Tuesday, June 23rd. The inmate was brought into corrections on June 13th. They were tested on the 19th. It was returned on the 20th. On June 22nd, 
uh, when he came when he was tested on the 19th and returned on the 20th that test was negative it was tested again on the 22nd it came back positive the inmate is quarantined as is all new entries into the system uh, are quarantined uh, contract contact tracing is underway uh, as a normal case of this I, I do want to um, uh, say that and I've said this many times well two other times that's many I guess um, that our greatest threat with our correctional facility right now are new intakes coming in as you as you know we had the new intake from Florida that we ended up having to test all of Marble Valley we had a new intake from Pennsylvania that went to uh, Chittenden um, that we end up mass, mass testing uh, the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility and we'll see based upon what we find out with Northwest uh, and the quarantine procedures there um, we have discovered that we really need to change our intake uh, method uh, we're putting too many facilities at risk um, as we quarantine at individual facilities so what we're looking at is trying to find uh, a quarantine procedure that concentrates quarantining at one or two facilities in the state so you would come in you'd be quarantined for 14 days you would be multiple day tested along that from zero to three to seven to 14 days you would be multiple uh, day tested don't uh, the days can alter but uh, multiple day tested as we as we move forward we just have to make sure as we did during the height of the pandemic to make sure that our facilities are clear of this virus we got we got to make sure that we take every effort to make sure it's not reintroduced into the correctional environment so we are looking at um, putting up a new quarantine procedure that has multiple day testing and is concentrated in one or two facilities uh, throughout the state that means that you would be come in you be quarantined in a single cell for 14 days and you would be multiple uh, multiple day tested during that time period We're determining that right now but because the person was quarantined in a single cell uh, during that time period we'll determine whether as normal course we do an investigation on this just to make sure there wasn't any exposure if we felt there was exposure the whole facility would be um, tested. We are, and by the way, I forgot to uh, add that we will be testing facility wide, one facility a week. Uh, so, we, starting uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be uh, we'll be testing facility wide, whether there's a positive or not. Uh, facility wide testing on correctional facilities, one a week. Just to, just to make sure that we aren't missing anything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Uh, yes. Uh, about this Fairhaven cluster, do we know if the business is still operating and uh, if the workers there were following the state guidelines before this all took place? The information we have is that there was uh, nothing that we know of at this point in time to indicate that there was not an adherence to the appropriate um, protocols that we've outlined. Um, I don't know as of today if the uh, business is still operating or not. Um, we're continuing to go through testing of the, of the workforce, so I don't know if there are uh, shut down and awaiting the word or if they're still operating. Okay, thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Can 
Can you hear me? I can. Um, thank you. Uh, a, a quick one for uh, the doctor and then um, a couple for the governor, if I may. How about just a um, quick one? How about a quick one for me and give him the other two? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, how about if some of the uh, outlets that have three or four people questioning uh, talk, give us a few questions? <laughs> but anyway, Dr. Levine. Um, with the uh, with a number of, uh, nationwide, with the number of uh, of cases going up and the number of con the confirmed fatality rate going down, wouldn't this suggest a, a diminution in the potency of the virus? Maybe perhaps something akin to like Mueller's ratchet. So you've just voiced a theory, which uh, I certainly can't you know uh, accept or refute. Um, but I would hypothesize my own theory is that um, because such a higher percentage of those who are testing positive are in the younger age demographic um, and may represent just a lack of adherence to the kinds of uh, four rules of thumb that we've talked about now that people can be out and about and they're taking that very liberally. Um, I'm thinking that maybe that's why there's less of a case fatality rate because all through this pandemic, when you look at the fatality rate in that below 50 age range, it's quite small compared to obviously much, much older age ranges. So I think it's just more people being infected um, who were a little bit lax uh, and took uh, the, their liberties a little too, too extensively, uh, getting out of a lockdown type of situation. Um, and now they're um, susceptible to the virus, but fortunately not susceptible to the worst outcomes. I see. Thank you. Um, Governor, you just mentioned the NASCAR thing without, with, without mentioning the fact that there, there, that there wasn't any news, that it was kind of like a, a hoax, that, that, that every, every garage door had a pull down on it for oh, well over a year. Yeah, I, I don't anyways, know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. If it was a hoax. Uh, I believe what they determined was that there, somebody had provided a noose uh, uh, maybe months ago uh, in that one garage area. I don't think it was commonplace throughout the garage, but in just that one garage. So I don't know if I call it a hoax, uh, but it certainly wasn't what uh, everyone thought it was. But but it doesn't doesn't preclude the fact that it was a proud moment uh, for NASCAR and what they did and the statement they made uh, in, uh, in reaction to that. I think that was powerful enough. Yeah, uh, anyways, uh, back to Vermont. Um, uh, have you had discussions with uh, Amy Tatko? Is she the AOT uh, COVID-19 public information and public outreach manager? She is uh, a PIO, I believe, of uh, Agency of Transportation, but not COVID related. Um, and are, are you aware of, uh, did you direct the AOT to uh, start allowing some graffiti and, uh, in, in state and, and, uh, and the directive says that, uh, that, that the AOT personnel now, uh, the policies changed regarding covering graffiti, that certain types of graffiti are, will be allowed and certain types um, disallowed and that the, the AOT personnel is supposed to take pictures and send uh, and, and, and if, if they think it's, a, it's questionable. Uh, isn't that allowing like some political messages to be, to be painted up on, on pro in, in, in a state with no billboard uh, laws? Are we, are we now going to allow uh, certain types of political graffiti or politically correct graffiti? Uh, uh, happy to, happy to look others? into Yeah, happy to look into that for you, Steve. Yeah, I, I just happened to get a directive here, and uh, and uh, it says it, this is what it says. Okay. Happy to take yeah, a look in, at in it. discussions with the governor. In discussions with the governor's office, the policy has been changed immediately, and that these voices need to be heard, and they want to use this as an opportunity to advance the discussion rather than censoring it. And, uh, and you, they're not. You, um, I, don't, I don't know. Are you are you referring to the Black Lives Matter? Um, in on the State Street and one possibly on Church Street. Is that what you're referring to? 
No, this is a statewide directive that went out to all AOT uh, supervisors or employees. I'll, I'll be happy to take a look. Okay, great. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Courtney, local 22. <laughs> Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, Governor, just a quick question regarding the single-use product law or the uh, plastic bag ban that will go into effect on July 1st. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any comments on this and how it will work with some places not allowing reusable bags uh, due to the pandemic. Um, well, again, this was an initiative passed by the legislature um, that uh, was put into place. Um, I don't know if Julie is, uh, Secretary Moore is on the line uh, but we've uh, I am governor okay well again um, we are allowing uh, there was uh, provisions in the law to allow for those to use up whatever stock they have and uh, they would be able to provide uh, paper bags uh, at that point uh, so it doesn't I, I don't know of any uh, institution that is not allowing recycled uh, or using uh, reusable uh, bags at this point but maybe secretary Moore has more details Yes, Governor, thank you. Uh, we are certainly working with retailers to, sh to spread the word that there is CDC-related guidance that indicates that there is no greater risk associated with, with reusable bags than, than any other surface contamination. Um, and we've heard positive response from a number of retailers in resuming the use of reusable bags, although in some instances requiring customers to bag their own groceries. Um, as the governor indicated, paper bags remain a viable alternative uh, to single-use plastic bags, and we are making allowances to allow retailers um, to continue to use any stock they may already have of plastic bags. Thank you. April, Burlington Free Press. Hi there, my questions were actually already answered. So just listening in and thank you so much. Thank, thank you, April. April. And Jack, NECN. It seems like you saved the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a question, Governor, for you, but, but perhaps if uh, Secretary Curley wanted to weigh in, that might be fine. Uh, it's about the way that uh, Vermont appears to people from the outside. Uh, Governor, you have been very outspoken, very articulate in your calls for making this state an ever more welcoming place. Um, I wonder, though, with the um, state parks opening on Friday, one of our state parks, one of the most beautiful, is named Camp Kill Care State Park. And that's three words. Each word begins with K. So we have three Ks in the name of uh, one of our state parks. And I'm just curious if there's ever been any thought given to looking at that name, uh, especially in the times we're in, if maybe it might be time to revisit that, or, or just if you have any thoughts at all on that. Um, I would be happy to let Secretary Curley answer that question. <laughs> um, but as well, um, I wasn't, uh, I, I guess I, I wasn't fully aware of that. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Uh, I'm sure um, our librarian might be able to, to have a better understanding of where uh, that uh, the origin was, or maybe Secretary Moore, but uh, Secretary Curley, you want to, anything you want to add to that? Apparently it was a boys camp from the early 1900s that the state then took over. And so it was a boy, a private boys camp years and years and years ago uh, that, was, that had this name. I don't think uh, our state librarian is aware of this one either. Julie, uh, Secretary no, I, Moore? I can speak to that. Sure, Governor. Uh, certainly, Jack, that this, this is a, a concern that, that we've discussed and debated, and it's, it's a challenge in that um, it reflects the, the history of that particular parcel and how we acquired it, and at the same time recognize the challenges with its name. Um, it's something we, we've had active conversations about before, and I, I'm sure will going forward. Um, and are, are aware of, of the concerns folks have expressed regarding the name and, and what possible alternatives there could be. Yeah, we'd be happy to look into that, obviously, um, and maybe just at the very least changing uh, the K to a C uh, for camp. Uh, that might help a little bit. Well, thank you very much. 
Thanks, Jack. That concludes our question. So that was the best for last. Thank you, Jack. Take care. Um, well, thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you on Friday.